This episode is brought to you by the Innovative Leadership Institute, working with companies that recognize the need to upskill their leaders and transform their organizations. We help executive teams prepare for accelerated uncertainty by creating the foresight needed to stay competitive and transforming organizations to become future ready. If you'd like to discuss how we can help prepare your organization for tomorrow, please visit InnovativeLeadership.com and click Contact Us. I'm Maureen Metcalf, your host for Innovating Leadership, Co-Creating Our Future. I'm also the founder and CEO of the Innovative Leadership Institute. Today, we welcome Dr. Karen Tilstra. Karen, your insights on creativity and innovation in the workplace will help our listeners be future ready. So thank you for joining us. Oh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for asking. Over the course of your career, you've created innovation labs and developed design thinking teams for healthcare systems, government agencies, universities, pro sports teams, and Fortune 500 companies. What major issues do those organizations commonly share? And I'm just curious too, how do you get that range of clients? Yeah, that's a very interesting question because I, over the years, have been very inspired how everybody wants to innovate. So some of the themes I've noticed is every one of those organizations you mentioned have good people, people who want to learn, people who want their organizations to succeed, people that are just open usually. And another common theme, it took me a while to piece this together, but every single organization wants innovation. The leaders want it. They call, we get set up and then fear sets in. Oh, we can't do that. Oh, the hierarchy or that's not how we normally do things. And so I think one of the biggest things along with fear is very tied to business as usual. And so I started saying innovation needs to be our business as usual. If you want your company to be innovative, stay relevant, stay ahead of disruption, you have to make innovation your business as usual, but that's hard. Even when they want it, it's hard. So my heart really goes out to people when I work with them because I see them trying and frontline staff, middle managers, top leaders all have a little different reaction, but it all seems to come down to what if we fail? What do people say? Well, who do you think they are over there trying to be innovative? So I've just noticed that theme through every place I've worked. We talk about leadership specifically, so that's our area of focus, taking on the mind of the scientist especially if you have to live with the implications of the thing you've done. Yeah. So we make a decision and it seems like we feel like it's forever. Now that may be true if you're investing in a significant building project right? or birthing children. It kind of is yeah. for the rest of your natural life. <laughs> yeah. A lot of the decisions we make, if we treat them like experiments, don't have to feel so weighty, like we have to get it, quote, right. We get it directionally correct right? and we can improvise. That is so absolutely 100% true. And what happens is, like I've said, leaders want innovation, but so much of the training and the Western world thinking, I say there's three myths of the Western world is nothing is connected. We have to know everything before we start and rational thinking is best. I think the training that we have locks us into thinking that we can't make a mistake and that we have to show perfect work. And I think the whole point of innovation is getting comfortable showing unfinished work, iterating forward and realizing we're not going to get it right, but we're going to learn as we go. And I, <laughs> oh, I've always said we could write lots of comedy shows over working with organizations and doing innovation because it gets to be quite hilarious because people mean well, but it's uncomfortable. And so they pull back. We have a little thing we like to teach leaders that there's four simple things they can do to make everybody comfortable. One is have a voice for innovation. Talk about it everywhere you go. The second is allow for resources. This doesn't mean money. It means people, time, place. Let people be educated and then hold people accountable. It doesn't mean you have to rewrite all the job descriptions, but just hold people accountable easily. It, you don't have to pin them to the wall, but I've seen some leaders do that really well. Once they understand that innovation when you're in a hierarchy, has to have some accountability. It can be a really beautiful thing. I love that. And I also love the idea that in some cases, it's not going to be comfortable. Mm -mm. We have to step into unknown spaces. We have to step into the feeling that as the leader, I remember very poignantly at some point, 
thinking like I'm supposed to have all the answers. Yeah. Like what a ridiculous thought that I'm going to have all the answers. And yet that's what we're taught. Right. And I think it's a pressure leaders feel and middle management and top leadership. They don't have to have all the answers. What I've seen in innovation, one of the best things leaders can do is create space, create space for things to emerge and get feedback. Feedback is a lifeline, honestly, to innovation. But yeah, that's a burden leaders carry that they have to have all the answers and they don't. We talk about the mindsets that we believe leaders need. And one is to be innately collaborative. The idea that I won't have all the answers. I need to invite people into the room who think differently, which is really hard because they're going to disagree with me. I'm going to feel less smart. It just feels messier. And yet that's the space between what we know. Seems like if we created a Venn diagram, that would be where innovation would live. Right. And we always say, if everyone's talking nice, innovation's not going to happen. Creativity loves constraints, difficult conversations. Wisdom lies within us. Wisdom lies within the frontline staff, the middle management, the top leaders. But I think what you said, leaders feel they have to have all the answers. Oftentimes that idea of letting the natural wisdom from the frontline bubble up is hard. Because it's like, we're supposed to be here with all the answers. I think leaders can set the vision and then open the doors and let the knowledge that lives within the organization rise up. In fact, people care about what they help create and they're responsible when they care. So leaders can relax, not take themselves quite so seriously and let things start to happen. And boy, that's not what we're taught in management school. (laughs) MBA school, they did not teach me relax and let it happen. Not at all. In fact, it's like the comedy show is just in the waiting. Leaders say, how how would the frontline people know? We were the ones hired for the answers. It's like, no, 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 no. Just create space. Nothing has to be forever. Let conversations happen. Conversation is one of the best problem solving tools. Let the wisdom rise up. It's hard though. It's hard. It goes against the hierarchy. Years ago, I used to teach the total quality management techniques early in my consulting career. And that idea that you work with the team who can solve the problem. Yeah. So one of my teams was clearing right of ways for a power company. Well, certainly the guys out on the equipment clearing the right of ways have to have a voice Yeah. because one of the team members from the central office had never even been on a right of way, had never been on the equipment. Oh. <laughs> like there's just no way that gentleman would have had better solutions than the people actually doing the work. That's what I keep saying. People are good. They're doing the best they can. People operate at the top of their skills and they're doing the best they can. But I see that all the time. People could come into our labs or different teams we're working with from the top or from people that had never been on the front line. We know what we need to do. We say, wait, hold on, hold on. Let's go out and experience what those people experience. Hear their stories, observe them. Every single time we've done that, people come back. They'll say, my mind is blown. We never had any idea it was like that, or that's what the real problem was. And it's actually doesn't cost much of anything to go learn from the people that are experiencing the problem or going to be affected by the opportunity that rolls out. But it's just not in our training. So let's dive in then to the theory behind your book, The Death Line, and how it relates to creativity being shifted both in and out of the workplace, because it sounds like what we're talking about is related to that. I love to talk about it because it means so much, I think, from my perspective. So I had done probably four years in working with a lot of different organizations. And again, I was somewhat stymied by the fact that everybody was gung-ho and then something would happen and a leader would shut down. Someone would become defensive or they'd say, nope, we can't do this. Uh, We're just going to go with the simple idea. So they had this fantastic idea and they came way down to something, just a fraction of what the impact the other would have had. So I started studying it and noticing that when people got to a point where it was uncomfortable, it was very easy and commonly they bailed. Their language changed. They became many times unpleasant. They would bail out of the team. And so I, one day in particular, I was working with a group of leaders And they were trying to reimagine a problem that they knew very well what it was, and they just wouldn't say it. And I said, for us to really solve this or start moving to get some solutions, let's really articulate what we're talking about. You've gone out and you've learned from the front line. And one lady said, well, 
We don't dare say it because then we have to admit we've been wrong for three years. And then it just hit me. I said, oh, I think that's like a death line for you guys. It just hit me. And I went over to the whiteboard and this huge whiteboard and just drew a line. And I said, this is a death line. You will go here and no farther. And the closer you get to this line, the worse your behavior gets. So then I explain it. We all have death lines. It's an imaginary line we draw that we vow we'll never cross because if we do, we're going to be embarrassed. We might fail. We might get rejected. Our boss might think we're crazy. When in reality, those lines that we draw, a death line, is based on our assumptions, our fears. And in actuality, if we cross that line, that may or may not happen. I mean, we may not be embarrassed. We may not get fired. But I've noticed over and over and over again, people sub-optimizing when they got to a certain point. Once I was able to articulate that, I just noticed it all over the place. Then I said, okay, I'm going to use this term, you guys. we got to use this term because this is going to help us. And then I noticed I started just teaching this word, death line, because I said, let's get it into our vernacular because then we could say, oh, I think I'm hitting my death line or it looks like you're hitting your death line. And it gave us a way to actually articulate exactly what was happening. It made it more manageable. But then people said, but how, Karen, you got this idea, but how do we do it? So that was another couple of years in trying to figure out. So then I one day was heading down Highway 408 and there's tolls on 408. And I had forgotten to renew my transponder. And so I had to go over to the toll booth and the crack up was the toll was a dime a little measly dime. And as I pulled out a dime to drop it in, I thought, well, this is what we need, a toll booth in our life. Because I had to change lanes, pause, slow down, pay the toll. So I came back to a team and said, okay, guys, I've been thinking about something. What if we create a toll booth technique? Pause, breathe, pay the toll. Pay the toll means ask, what's really going on here? What's going on with me? Why am I suddenly closing down? Why am I becoming defensive? Why am I bailing out? And so we tried that. And then I started noticing there were four things that people could do to really help them once they had paused and breathed and identified, okay, my death line's activated or your death line's activated. There were four things. I call them the ACE words, not childhood trauma ACE, but space, grace, pace, and place. So space means I need new headspace. Grace means providing grace to people. Pace means what pace do I need? Because I noticed everything we were doing was at top speed. It's like, whoa, sometimes we just got to slow down. And place, I started noticing putting people in different places changed the conversation. What I loved about the ACE, the ACE word, I realized ACE could stand for always create engagement. So when you are feeling like you have hit a death line, your death line, maybe it is, I can never be embarrassed in front of my team. And you feel that might be happening and you then pull back, pause, breathe, and ask, what's really going on? Do I need new headspace? Do I need to give grace? Do I need a different pace? Do I need to be in a different place? You don't need all four. You could do one, maybe sometimes all four come in handy. But then once I started teaching that, I noticed people started using that language and things got better in the teams. These are innovation teams. They were able to move forward because we're bringing people in and training them in innovation as they're working. So we needed a way to help people who were not naturally working in, I would say, processes beyond the hierarchy that challenge the hierarchy. Anyway, that's a long definition, but anyway, that's it. I love that. And I'm just thinking of in politics, we call it the red lines. We don't cross this red line. Oh, well, it's funny. Several of my friends have said, oh my gosh, Karen, why'd you say death line? That's so grim. But I said, no, it is grim. And that's what I want it to be. Because when we draw a death line and refuse to cross it, we have something has died. Conversation, our cooperation, something. You know what I love about that is it brings to awareness that we have constructed something often unconsciously. And I'll use a completely ridiculous example, but I certainly have a death line that I won't walk out of the house without clothing. Yeah. Because that would be highly embarrassing. Right. We have some of these that are probably self-protective. I'm glad you brought that up. In the book, just kind of allude to there's physical death lines, like stepping out of a plane without a parachute. Okay. We know what's going to happen. I use the example of, because someone told me they did this as a little trial, getting into an elevator and standing so close to somebody that your hips touch, your shoulders touch, and you don't know them. That'd be like walking out of the house without clothes on. People are going to say, oh, this person's creepy. Why are they standing so close to me? Okay. Those are societal death lines or physical death lines 
that we know what's going to happen. There's no question the outcome. But the um, personal death lines, we don't know the outcome. We just think we know the outcome. And that's what I love, the idea of self-awareness then, and we construct them. Right. To your point, it's not like a speed limit that's posted on the side of the road. Yeah. It's that I create my own line, and my line is probably not the same line as other people in the meeting. And yet I will expect them to act with urgency around the things that scare me. Exactly. This last winter after the book came out, I was teaching a group of people for a county. We had already built the lab and then they wanted a whole nother cohort going in, knowing how to work in the lab. And so I said, my book just came out, let's use it. And two of the ladies in particular really resonated with the book. And one of our sessions, she came in and she said, Karen, I have to tell you, I hadn't mentioned before that I'd gotten promoted within my team. And I was so excited about it. And I felt like, wow, people are going to love this. They're going to support me. And she said, they didn't. The first meeting, they were cold. And then I had some ideas and they criticized. And she said, I was so discouraged. I realized I was not ready for this promotion. So she said, I was just writing an email to my boss saying, I think I better take my old job back. Just as another lady in their group came by her office who had been her friend and said, what are you doing? And she said, I can't do this. She said, I just have too much negative feedback. And the other lady said to her, oh, no, you got to remember the death lines. You are caught in the web of their death lines. I thought that was so interesting. I said, wow, ladies, that is so cool. And actually, the lady who had gotten promoted started crying and she said, I thought it was me. So the whole group, we talked about that. We said, well... It probably wasn't you. Your boss saw something in you to give you a promotion. It was your team's problem that they couldn't handle it. So their death lines got activated. I love that. Caught in the web of other people's death lines. So that's a whole nother level. She decides to stay in the promoted role. How does she engage with her team to explore their death lines? And maybe she exposes her own as well. So we talked about that. We were teaching at that point, conversation is still the best problem solving tool. And I really believe that when we have a team and there's a problem and we put everything we can on their shoulders and not take the problem away from them, that if she could go in and say, I'd love to hear from you. It seems like everyone's not happy about this. Let's talk. And I didn't know she'd be willing to do that, but she kind of practiced, said, I want to hear from you. What do you want from me? How can I support you? And it was interesting. They did actually respond to her. Well, she was a very sweet lady. And she went to them and talked. She said, I think you guys should read this book. So she bought the book for her team and she she made them read it. Now, I don't know if they liked it or not, but anyways, she came back and reported it had gotten better. She said it wasn't perfect, but she was going to continue. They wrote out some goals and she said, what are some trigger things that I do that you guys don't like? And let's just talk. She had gotten really, really honest and transparent, which is the key to innovation. Just like forgiveness is a core to innovation. And I said to her, I think you have to have a forgiving heart towards them, just like they need a forgiving heart towards you. That takes time. I've been amazed when you talk to people, let them have a voice, things begin to happen. Movement happens. And that's what we always want is movement. So you just talked about forgiveness. You've talked about grace. You've talked about communication. What would a more productive, more fulfilling professional landscape look like? And how do you hope leaders evolve to move into that innovative, generative future? Oh, that is a nice question. One of my team thought this up. I I have to give him credit, Richard. He said, you know, if every leader could just have this mantra, knowing your death line is your lifeline. And I said, oh, that's awesome, Richard. It's true. And I think that's part of it is knowing who we are. I think that if we could give leaders a break, I think there's a lot of pressure on leaders that they have to be perfect. They have to have all the answers. And so one thing I've said is let's take the work seriously, but let's not take ourselves so seriously. Let's give everyone room to grow, to learn through their mistakes. In fact, I've gone so far as to say, don't fire anybody, hold them responsible to their own actions. I was leading a team of about 14 several years ago. That's just my mantra. I just wasn't going to fire anybody. I don't care how bad they got. I told him this one person had several, several things that HR said, you ought to just fire him. I said, well, that's the easy way out. In innovation, why don't we step into the problem? So I'd say, you know what, what if I don't ever fire you and you have to face what it is you're doing? And just like, what? And I know it sounds really crazy, but I am telling you every time I've done that with people that I feel aren't quite on track, they rise. I cannot explain it. They just rise. 
and we're going to work with you. Let's get the skills you need. Let's find out what's not working for you. And let's just say, what if this could become a place? Unless I say, unless you really don't want to be here. If that's the case, just go. But I'm going to hold you accountable for the person you can be, your future highest self. And some of the people who would we brought on, young people, I just can't believe where they are now. And I'm not saying it was just me, but I do think that if leaders could I feel very passionate about this. If leaders could relax, especially in middle management, they have so much pressure. It's like, why all this pressure? Honestly, why do we have so much pressure? We're all just humans. We're all trying to do the best we can. Let's just calm down. I know that sounds very ethereal or very like off in la-la land, but I have seen big companies when the leaders take the work seriously, but not themselves so seriously, they open a pathway for innovation to happen which we could talk forever about how that works and give room for people to have a voice, to be visible, to rise, to matter. I have never seen people reject that. Now, sometimes the front line will say, whoa, you're asking my opinion. I better not give it. Um, and I'm just here to do my job. Don't ask me. But if you work with the front line, they have wonderful, awesome insights because they're right there. But they do get overlooked because it's just the way oftentimes organizations are set up. So I think if leaders could create space, learn some of the, I would say, the pathway of innovation and creative thinking and embrace it because nothing is the end of the world except the end of the world. And that's, I see a lot of leaders saying, well, I can't allow the front line to be involved. Why not? Why can't you? It's like, well, that's not what we're supposed to do. <laughs> I mean, it's almost like there's no answer. But I do know organizations are profit-driven. They've got to make their investors happy. But if we could flip it around and say, what if we really keep our employees happy and give them a voice, what could happen to our organization? There's a lot we could say about that, but helping people become competent and develop competencies in innovative practice and creative thinking is one of the best forms of leadership. In fact, I'll say this, after putting this book out and really uh, working with the idea I think you could teach the best leaders, they could come out the best leadership program, but if they don't understand about death lines, nothing is going to really matter. An area where our work significantly overlaps is the idea of self-awareness. If something's happening inside of me and I'm not aware of it, it owns me. Exactly. If I'm tense and frustrated with something, a conversation I've had, I will carry that into the next meeting. If I'm not aware enough that I have to process it before walking in, then I dump that on my colleagues. Exactly. And death lines are so much below our conscious level. And actually, one thing about death lines is we think they keep us safe. Actually, we kind of like them. We kind of treasure them because they keep us safe. But in reality, they keep us sub-optimized. They hurt our potential. You know, there's one thing we used to do when we were running one large healthcare organization where we had a lot of projects and I had facilitators coming in and out of different projects. So we called it our threshold passage. So we would say, when you walk through the threshold of the next group you're meeting, just imagine there's a fan blowing and all that blew off of you. Enter in new. And we actually practiced it. And it was very productive, actually, because it was not a magic bullet. All it did is raise people's awareness that, oh, I'm carrying these concerns, this heaviness from what I just experienced, or actually sometimes excitement and joy. But the team they were going to didn't need the facilitator to be all excited and joyful. They just needed them to listen. So we would call it just remember the threshold before you go from this team to that team. That was just fun. I love that. I just think about taking a shower. We had a fan, but it might have been good to have like a walk go through a waterfall or something. Yeah. <laughs> With all the heat waves, maybe a mister. Oh my gosh. Here in Florida. Although we're not as hot as California, but it feels as hot. Well, and mist may not be good when it's 110 degrees yeah. and humid. And you never dry off, <laughs> right? <laughs> I love the idea of being aware and blowing off so we can return to neutral. That the goal isn't right. yippee skippy or it's engaged and neutral and constructive. There were many times, like um, in the book, I point out there was a lady that was very competent. She was in a top middle management. Her boss had asked her to organize these cookies for Christmas. She had a team and she also had a bunch of interns that were working with her. She just didn't like that assignment. She said, you know what? I'm offended that he asked me to do that. Probably because I'm a woman. He asked me to do the cookies. So she just completely bailed on that project. Didn't tell him. 
till about two days before. And she said, I just thought I wasn't going to do it. It's beneath me. I am not a cook. And her boss said, you know what? All you need to do was get your interns, make a few phone calls. I didn't expect you to do it, but it actually led to her being fired because it was like the last straw. And I said, what really happened? And she said, you know, I just was so afraid of making a mistake that I made so many mistakes. And she said, I didn't leave any room for anything to happen. So I included that little story in the book because I found that happening over and over is that when something happens, we see it from our perspective. Oh, this is what's going on. And then our death lines get activated and we just become ineffective. And this lady said, you know what? I looked back and said, I couldn't believe I did that. But I said, why do you think though you did it? And she said, I just was so afraid. I was so afraid I was going to fail or people were going to make fun of me that I was a cookie person. I just thought it was interesting, but I thought it's an example of a death line. We were talking about the death line. She said, well, I know my death line is I didn't want anyone to view me any less than I was. And I was very afraid people would view me as something like just a menial person. And I thought how interesting that was. And why I think that story is so powerful is because she had a lot of resources at her disposal. She had 12 interns that would have gladly done the job. She had other people on her team. But I think that's the key with death lines is once they get activated, our vision just narrows down into, we just can't have anything go wrong. And then we just kind of freeze up. We use a framework that comes from Bob Keegan and Lisa Leahy talking about big assumptions. And it sounds very similar that we have an unconscious assumption that when we play it out, looks like I'm going to die. So growing up in a family where performance was expected, like most people, frankly, there's some level of assumption that if I don't perform, when I first started to uncover this, I was living in a downtown condo and there was a man living under the bridge by my condo. And he had a drinking problem because we would hear him, you know, and see him under the bridge. And periodically there was a woman with him and we would hear her screaming. So there were fighting and stuff. Oh. <laughs> and my fear was, I'm going to mess it up so badly that I'm going to be living under the bridge with that homeless mean guy. And it's completely irrational. I was not going to mess things up so badly that I had to live under a bridge. But all of us, no matter how competent, to your point, have this death line or this big assumption that if X happens and then we go sliding down that crazy long slope, mine being having to camp out next to the homeless, drunk, violent man. Part of the reason I bring that up is it doesn't matter how competent we are. Right. We all have them and we all get activated by them and we can't manage it until we know it. Exactly. In fact, if ever I'm tempted to feel like, oh, wow, what is wrong with you? Get a grip, person. I just am reminded by the incident that happened to me when um, this is way back. I don't know if you remember the Night Stalker. He was going around LA back in the like middle 80s. Well, I would have been working overseas. We came home. I heard about the Night Stalker. My husband and I were visiting my parents who were little gold rush town on Highway 49, eight hours from LA in a house that was off the beaten path. And that night I told my dad, I said, I am so afraid the Night Stalker is going to come. And he said, okay, Karen, let's just think about that. Let's see. He'd have to get at 210, up five, over here to Highway 209, up. And then once he got to our little town of Sonora, he would have to veer off, go down this road around the city park. I don't think he's coming. I remember thinking, wow, why did I think that? But I'm telling you, I did. And I actually was fearful. And whenever I am working with a group and I hear someone say something that I perceive to be so irrational and what could be classified as ridiculous. I just remind myself of that crazy time I thought the Night Stalker would travel eight hours and seek me out and kill me. <laughs> it just all, we all have to have a little grace with each other and ourselves too. Can you share some tools so that when I'm in that place where my body's flooded with adrenaline, I'm afraid I'm living under a bridge and you're afraid that you're going to be killed by a stalker. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we drop into that place in something we're fearful, not rational. I'm as embarrassed about looking stupid among my peers when I'm afraid and irrational. So then that piles onto it. How do I go from fear rather than opportunity? And I have to get back to sane quickly so that I can continue to lead the meeting, do the job, produce the deliverables. There are two things that I found that's helpful because oftentimes you just can't tell people snap out of it. They have experienced a boss yelling at them or being rejected or whatever. I just say what I call the mother of all questions, to pause and breathe 
ask what's really going on here and then share it with a friend or a colleague or just say, hey, help me get some perspective. Oftentimes a colleague will say, oh, no, that's not a problem. It's just actually verbalizing can help us deal with it. It's when we get isolated. In fact, you know, that's the whole thing about some mental health is isolation, is that when we connect, when we share, when we collaborate, things get better. To train ourselves to pause, breathe, what I call the toll booth technique, pause, breathe, and pay the toll. What's real, ask, what's really going on here? And then the other, those ACEs were just tools to help us what would be the next steps. But we get so locked in our own heads when we... We don't have to. Oftentimes when we're leading teams, we say, remember guys, we're going to take this seriously, but we're not going to take ourselves so seriously. We're going to really embrace that. And we have all kinds of things we do with teams to help them remember that. Like we have what we call the woohoo cheer. We, oh, there's, well, we can talk forever. That's in the second book, the one-on-one, but just understanding that we're all humans. We're all connected. We all want the best. And I honestly believe after working with thousands of people, we all have an innocence inside us that exist that sometimes we just people don't see it because our behavior sometimes is blocks the innocence and they say well that person's crabby or they're not cooperative or they're really hard to work with when actuality everyone is trying to do the best they can and again i i just always say we work at the top of our skills and sometimes we just need better skills it's not about being a bad person or a bad leader there's just so much room for grace and when we have grace good things happen. So as you say that working at the top of our skills, I'm thinking of the mental health issues people are facing now. People are at the top of their skills. They're at the top of their emotional capacity. Mm -hmm. So we've got folks dealing with healthcare or getting their kids back to a place of some sense of safety and security because now our next generations are traumatized. They're not as comfortable as, as I was at their ages. Right. So we've got folks who I'm working at the top of my skills, I'm overwhelmed, I'm trying to manage everything in life. And it's hard to just get through the day and get it all done. And so how do I help someone not take themselves seriously? Right. Because life is serious. I think that's an excellent question. I don't have all the answers to that, but I have noticed when we ask people, people from all walks, what's really going on? and give them time to answer. And they don't even have to answer to me. If we could just say, what's really going on here? I have found that question to be a question that opens the gate. Now, maybe they need help. Whatever the case is, oftentimes what we have found when people are working well, trying to solve problems, oftentimes they are like, this is never going to solve this. What we hear a lot, we'll work with an organization and then a leader might say, hey, would this team work with this particular situation? Well, that's never going to be solved. This is never going to happen. So when we unpack that, like, tell us what's really going on. What do you know about the problem or the challenge or the potential opportunity? What do you assume about it? And when we ask people to actually take time to unpack what they know, and we have them do it in a group and what they assume, it is so cathartic. And then we say, so we're going to capture powerful questions that come out of this. Because if you ask people when they're overwhelmed, what's the big question? It's like, I don't even know. It's just never going to work. But I really do think conversation is still the best problem solving tool. And when you give people room to be real, to be transparent, that failure is part of living and we can learn from failures and that we can iterate our way forward. We don't have to have all the answers right now. We could come up with a prototype of a solution and try it. If it works, great. If it doesn't, what we learn from it? We can seek feedback from people. These are all things that somehow in our Western world, we have not captured enough. I've heard of one of my professors in my doctoral program say, the problem with prototyping is we just don't do it enough. And we just save it for the people in GM who are making cars. But prototyping could be simply a mother that's overwhelmed with coming home and cooking after working all day. And maybe she's a single mother. Well, what are some other ways we could try that don't sit all on her shoulders? Because oftentimes what we found, and again, I'm not saying I have all the answers by any means, but we have found when people could just, whoever they're working with, let's just sit down and talk. What are some other solutions? They don't have to be perfect. So say a mother and her children, that'd be a group. The mother takes all the responsibility on her shoulders. I feel like if you really want things to work, you have to put responsibility on other people's shoulders too. You might see people say, well, yeah, we know that. Mm -hmm. But in practice, we forget it. And then we say, sit down with the children. How might we work this out, kids? I'm working all day. I come home. I can't handle all the meals. 
surprising what children will come up with or teenagers. I'm not saying it's a perfect, that's just an example of how we start conversations. I think problems get solved. People start feeling more engaged, less stress when space is created. We don't have to be perfect, but we think we do. I love that. I, one of the questions I use, and I'm engaged with a conversation with a client right now, what would happen if you removed this barrier? What would these relationships look like? So first of all, I'm introverted. There are people who would prefer to write that to me rather than speak it. Yeah. It gives them a chance to think. And what I'm seeing with this one client is he's saying, I've not given voice to this yet. Oh. So I've not said to anyone, I haven't given myself time to look inside and feel the feelings. Yeah. And I'm going to write it down. And it's been fascinating to see this gentleman process what's happening inside through his writing and fairly quickly is starting to take action. Awesome. So was it your idea to have him write something? It was. Awesome. You didn't know if it was going to work. You threw out an idea. Did he want to engage with it? Because you created a way to move. When we get stuck, overwhelmed, ready just to say this is too much. We don't have ways to move because we think this has to be this way. Well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. That's an awesome example that you created. You threw an idea out. So you put an idea, let's iterate it. Let's prototype it. Let's see if it works. And it did work. That's awesome. But if it didn't work, you would have then had a way to converse. Okay. What are some other things we could do? Now the conversation is going. I love that. Thank you. And it's interesting. I sent a similar question to two people on the same day, one sent, uh, you know, like put a heart on it, but didn't send the answers. So <laughs> nice that you thought these were good questions, but the point was answer them. <laughs> the other one that I didn't think was going to answer it, spent a great deal of time thinking it through and engaging in the interaction with me. Now, the one who didn't respond may have done the reflection. I don't know. I'll circle back. That's awesome because we forget that without reflection, there's no learning. And so to get people to reflect, Oftentimes, that's just all they need to do is just say, hey, let me just think about this. Because wisdom does lie within us. And I think we forget that. And systems help us forget it. And a lot of times, systems or hierarchies, we need hierarchy. But sometimes we put all our trust in hierarchy or hierarchies. And it doesn't give time to reflect. Hierarchies aren't highly reflective systems. So it's amazing what people can do when given a prompt when given a chance to speak, to be transparent, to let them realize they're not so terrible, that other people are experiencing what they're experiencing. We've just seen people thrive and grow because the work we do in innovation and creativity in organizations is scary for people, even though they want to do it. It's like, am I going to get fired if I say this? Because we're all about transparency and <laughs> You can get some touchy situations come up when you're trying to reimagine a system or a process within an organization. How do you create a culture where the transparency is accepted? And I realize this is back to the discomfort. Some people aren't going to be comfortable with it. They're not going to like it. Right. But I don't have to like everything that happens. Accept it. I love you said that we don't have to like everything that happens. You asked very good questions. <laughs> How to create a culture that supports Creativity and innovation, creativity and innovation always, well, if they're really pure, they need transparency. What we found, I'm not speaking about teenagers, troubled teenagers, although we've had a lot of teenagers come into our labs and they really get innovation. And they, anyway, when you have a system, what we've found anyway, is some education has to happen first. Innovation and creativity for some of the parts have to happen outside the hierarchy. Communication and transparency has to be more than the hierarchy allows. Working with leaders, giving people space. That's what I'm talking about, the place. The place matters. Put, get them out of the conference rooms. Get them out of their regular rooms where they have their department meetings. Put them in a room or a space where they feel more comfortable. Set some expectations. We have all kinds of things. But like, let's have a transparent conversation. And oftentimes we find starting with like a, what do you know and what do you assume? It's pretty it's like, oh, well, I had the same assumption. Or I remember one time we were doing that <laughs> We were with doctors and nurses and one nurse said, well, one, one thing we do know is all doctors hate nurses. And one doctor said, well, I'm married to one, so I don't hate that nurse. People just have a chance to talk. I think it starts with conversation, creating space for conversation to happen, giving people permission and holding them responsible. I personally think if you're talking about an organization, the facilitators uh, can hold that space. 
So what I call, we've created what we say, lifeguard facilitation. And when we were starting one of the labs, my son was a lifeguard down at the YMCA. And I was down there one day and I noticed he sat up in his chair. He just kept people safe. If someone was dunking, he blew the whistle. Someone was running, hey, slow down. And I thought, what if we did facilitation that way? And we told people, we want to talk about this. Here's some of our prompts. And we're going to do what we call lifeguard facilitation. If somebody is hijacking and we would one thing we found is when we explained hijacking can be loud or silent. And a silent hijacker is just as powerful as a very bully style hijacker. People actually fell in line. And when we said, we haven't heard from everybody, what, what, what would you like to say? Or we use different ways, but to give people space, give them permission and have them be responsible. I'm talking about adults. There's different ways, like with children. Children usually don't have a problem unless they've been traumatized at some level. When we're trying to create a space that people can be transparent, we talk about permission and responsibility. We usually have a top leader come in and say, we would like to have an honest conversation. And then we also have this hat we call the dang sure hat. We originally called it the damn sure hat, but one of the people didn't really like that. So we said, okay, we'll call it the dang sure hat. And we actually introduced it and said, when the person who wants to be the dang sure monitor, and when someone's hijacking, they would just raise their hand and say, I think there's a hijack. Another thing we did, that these are just very overt types of things, but another thing we did is some of the labs we created, we created like a, what we called a badge tree in organizations that had badges that signified different levels. And this was not my idea. This was idea from some nurses we were working in the healthcare system. So when they came in, they hung their badge on the badge tree and they said, this is what we required. I'm checking in. And then we said, you know, it's an overt way to say I'm here. I was amazed how that badge tree worked. Again, we gave people permission and then we had them be responsible. Actually, that badge tree became kind of well-known and people would come around and say, what is this badge tree? And people started to copy it in different ways. I thought that was cool. But people need permission many times to be able to speak, but then the responsibility factor has to be there. That means we're all responsible to hear, to listen. We might not know exactly how to respond, but we can listen. And then we just have so many different times we have had to bring people together and talk about difficult things. And i like, whoa, is this going to work? We kind of hold our breath, but we said, no, we, and we had to do it. We had to be true to our own process, even if it was scary, like have a, some really powerful top leaders and frontline people who are very afraid. We also had to train frontline people. We oftentimes had that come ahead of time and say, you're going to feel uncomfortable because there's going to be some big leaders in here, but they want to hear from you. And we had to make them feel safe. At the same time, we had to do some training with the top leaders that they didn't have to come in and bombard everybody, or they didn't have to just not join in. That was a big thing we found with a lot of top leaders. I'll just sit here and not say anything. Uh, no, if you're here, you got to say something because if you're here and not saying anything, you're going to traumatize the group. It's really exciting to see. People want to participate. They want to engage. They want to have a voice. They want to matter. Oftentimes, systems give them no way to do that. That's how we can create the systems. When you mentioned the badge tree, it reminds me I worked with an Air Force missile organization. And the senior executive of that organization was the best I've seen at joining the group, kicking it off so he's not silent and just sitting there checked out. And with his check-in, he would basically say, I want to hear what you have to say, and then I'll share my point of view. So it was clear he wasn't disengaged, but he wanted to give everyone the opportunity to have a voice. That's awesome. It took a while for people to trust him. Yeah, it does take a while because people are, we are very much oriented towards understanding how hierarchies work. Again, we need certain hierarchies, but if we're going to be innovative and really be learning organizations, we have to understand when we can work beyond the hierarchy. One thing we did working with a lot of innovation projects that affected leadership, we always had frontline people involved and sometimes they had to go talk to a leader and it just got so lost. Oh, well, you got to talk to this assistant manager, and then they've got to talk to the manager and they've got to talk to the assistant director and then the assistant director dot, 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 up the line. So we created what we called the meat grinders. Not M-E-A-T, but M-E-E-T. And we started teaching meat grinders to the leaders, to people that were all in the, that they wouldn't feel offended or like, hey, why that person? They can't just go talk to the leader. They were five minute meetings and we had to get some information from the top leader. 
So because they were three to five minutes and they could have walking to one meeting to another, and as different leaders learned about it, and we, we tried to train all the leaders in it, it was a non-threatening, this is what's happening in our project. We just need some information from you. Can you give it to us? Da, 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 da. And then back, it worked really well because we really had to think how we could keep the organizations we were helping be innovative when the hierarchy still existed. And they thought of things too. It wasn't just us. I mean, I was amazed what people came up with. It was awesome. As you mentioned that, I think of the ideas of like skunk works versus the run the business, innovate the business. And it's often difficult to both run and innovate using the same people in the same structure. Are your innovation labs pulled out of the hierarchy or do you operate within the hierarchy or is it depends? So we do three things at Creativity Effect. We teach innovation processes and innovation and, and creative thinking processes. We run workshops that are standalone and then we consult. And so if an organization calls, like right now we're working with three organizations helping them build what I said, innovation initiative, stuck right in the heart of the system where we do big, massive educations. But these innovation labs, point is to create a culture that supports innovation. I use design thinking because design thinking, I feel is a very safe, easy to learn, self-correcting methodology that doesn't require a lot of ramp up. So if we're going to have a system-wide innovation initiative where everybody is involved and everybody's job has something to do with innovation, even if they're the front desk person, how might they innovate what they're doing? Everything supports the goals and aspirations of the company, but it's a way for everyone to be involved and keep the organization learning, agile, Leaders have information from the front line. I've developed this little saying that it's not very nice. Some people don't like it, but the closer you get to the top, the farther you are from the truth. And when we tell that to leaders, sometimes they'll say, oh my gosh, that is so true, but I hate to hear it. And so our innovation labs, you have to have the top leader in it. Otherwise it's not going to work. They have to support it through what I was saying, their voice, where they talk whenever they can. They hold people accountable. They give resources. It's just not money. It's time, people in place, and they allow for people to be educated and they embrace it. And it's an awesome process because everyone's supporting the goals and aspirations of the company, the profit driven side, but they have voices. They're able to weigh in. And we've seen employee engagement rise. It's not overnight, but in one setting, it was a 28% employee engagement raise. In fact, I still see people around places we've worked with and then moved on to someone else at a restaurant or something. Oh, Karen, wow, you know, we're still doing this. We're still remembering the things. Now, if a new leader comes in, all bets are off. I mean, they might say, forget it. We're not doing this. So it, it's always just a short time that things can happen in innovation unless you have continual leadership buy-in when there's changes in leaders. I, I've always said that. We can't do anything with a new leader that does not have that kind of mindset. That's a crucial point is organizations can invest a lot of money and human effort. It can disappear. Yeah. And, and that's where senior leaders buy in and in some cases board buy in. Because if the board buys it, even with the leadership change, they'll spark continuing things they've invested in. And here's one thing that we have to do. And I have to always remind myself, we have to keep revisiting with the leaders. We're working with a commission right now, but they have to be brought in because a lot of times like, what is this? Isn't this kind of big waste of time? We got people coming in and bringing their challenges in and trying to solve them. So they have to help them understand what a learning organization is organizations to be successful have to be learning organizations. And it isn't just bringing the consultant down the road to come in and teach a new process. I always work with a core team and train, educate them, and then they become the ambassadors of the program. We're there to help them. But if it's not from systemic out, I like to have a core team across the spectrum, across functional team. So when we leave, it's not like, oh, now what do we do? We still have to monitor and innovation has to be something you keep revisiting. I think that's with anything though. But I get so excited and so honored to be working with different people who, when they learn about innovative process, their competency raises new mindset skills and tools. It's just exciting to see what, what they're able to do and how they work it in their own jobs. And oftentimes, well, this is what I've seen. Cultural innovation labs, like the ones I'm talking about, helps the whole organization stay at the top of their game. It does not threaten top leadership. It's not taking any power away from top leadership, but it's giving people a place and a pathway to solve their problems and to get relevant and sustainable solutions. And it gives them a voice. 
in fact, we've created this uh, four minute report out where executives come in and we tie every innovation project to a top leader. Uh, we call it a power source. When it's done, we have a four minute process that they can come and hear what it is. Everything we do is we're trying to do it kind of rapid speed when it involves executives because we know they have no time. They're double, triple, quadruple booked. But anything we can do to keep the conversation going, keep the information flowing, and keep people doing. That's what organizations are really about. Karen, thank you so much. So will you give our listeners the names of your books, the book website, and how you would best like people to reach out to you? Um, my first book, I wrote this book out of it, but I saw a big need. The Death Line, Stopping the Number One All-Time Killer of Human Potential. It's a very easy, easy read. And then the next book that just came out a couple weeks ago was 101 Activities to Ignite Collaboration, Boost Creativity, and Fuel Innovation. I really felt compelled to write this book to share a lot of the things we do with teams. In fact, if we think we created something, we're all excited about, oh, we have this new thing we created. We just wait a month or two and we find, oh, they're doing the same thing over there. So I humbly say we wrote this up. A lot of the stuff we, we created, but other people are doing it too. Some things we tweaked. There's an improv section, a yes and section, which I'm a big believer in that we tweaked some of those and some of them, one of our teammates is an improver. He helped us get those in. But we presented this just in Phoenix two weeks ago with a group of about 85 teachers and they actually were very responsive to it. Creativity Effect is the company we have. It's creativityeffect.com. But yeah, we love to talk with people. We love to share anything we've learned that could help anybody. Not that we have all the answers, but we've certainly encountered a lot of people and we love to share what we've learned so maybe other people could it'd be easier pathway for them. But just my thing is knowing your death line is your lifeline. Thank you, Karen, for sharing your wisdom with us today. And thank you, listeners. We hope Karen's wisdom, practical tools about creativity and innovation help you become a more future-ready leader. Everybody loves innovation. Everybody wants innovation. Innovation.